Albert's Bridge Books presents Magician in Trouble, an Eli Marks short mystery written by John Gaspard, read by Jim Cunningham, music by Chip Barber. It was clearly a mix-up. Not as bad as the time my agent sent me to a bachelorette party and sent Sexy Rex, the stripping fireman, to the Handelman bat mitzvah. But it was clearly a mistake, nonetheless. That was my first thought when I turned onto the street where my GPS had guided me. Ahead of me, I saw the road filled with squat cars. A deputy held up a hand to impede my progress and then approached my driver's window. Do you live on this block, sir? Um, no. I'm here for a gig, a, a, a show. You're not by any chance a magician, are you? Yes, officer, yes. Yes, I am. He reached up to the radio on his shoulder and depressed a button. He's here, was all he said. He then stepped back and waved me through. I put the car in gear and crept forward into the flashing circus at the center of the block. There had been nothing in the booking which had flagged it as unusual, except that it came in last minute. But even that wasn't completely out of the ordinary. Performers often ran into scheduling issues, and so a call from my agent wondering if I was available for a filling gig in a couple of hours was not completely unheard of. Once I got through the barricade, I inched the car forward and was directed by another deputy into a space haphazardly sandwiched between a fire truck and an ambulance. He gestured me out of the car and I followed, returning seconds later to grab my bag. This is the guy, the deputy said by way of introduction to a small cluster of very serious looking uniformed officers. The one who appeared to be in charge, a large bald man who loomed over me, gave me the once over. I'm Sheriff Martin. You're here to see Leon Pearson? The client's name was in my phone, but it didn't feel like the right time to start digging for that device. Yes, I, I think that's the name. He's been asking for you. Me in particular? You're the magician, right? Yes. Well, he said he'd come out peacefully after he sees the magician. Peacefully? Here's the situation. We think he's in there alone, and we think he's armed. He threatened the mailman a couple of hours ago and vaguely suggested he was in possession of a weapon. That's what brought us out here. He threatened the mailman? Something about being tired of only getting bills and bad news. We were able to get him on the phone, but he won't come out. Says he booked a magician, and that's who he's waiting to see. That would be you. Get him a vest. It seems he wants a magic show, so that's what we're gonna give him. Do a couple of tricks and then see if you can get him to come out. Another man pushed his way toward us, grumbling as he did. Martin, you're just handing him a hostage. Is that it? That seems like a bad, bad idea. I didn't know who this guy was, but I was liking the way he thought. Look, Swanson, I'm doing everything I can to de-escalate this matter. He called for a magician. So unless you know of a deputy who can pull a rabbit out of a hat, I say the smartest thing we can do right now is give Pearson what he wants. Here, put this on. I held the vest gingerly and then handed it back to him. I can't wear that. What? I can't wear that. Good idea. No sense getting him riled up by taking an offensive posture. Actually, the vest will cover my pockets and inhibit my movements. If you want me to perform magic, it will have to be without the vest. Look, he seems like he's really on edge. Do what you can to calm him down. Do a couple of tricks, entertain him, then see if you can coax him outside. If my tricks are bad enough, maybe that'll force him out. I've been known to clear a room. They stared back at me. Got it. Do a couple of tricks, coax him outside. And whatever you do, just don't make things worse. I couldn't help but smile. If I have one mantra as a performer, that was probably it.
I was about halfway across the front lawn when my common sense caught up with me. Was this really the wisest course of action? I looked at the house, which was a small rambler. The shades were drawn and no lights were visible within, although the porch light was on. Unlike the houses on either side, the front door was painted red. I vaguely remembered this design touch indicated a welcoming environment. I hoped that was going to be the case. I stepped up to the door and looked for a bell. I couldn't find one, so I knocked. My first attempt was so soft I could barely hear it myself. I tried again. It still sounded like a very weak woodpecker who'd lost the will to live. However, it seemed to have registered. Leon Pearson must have been watching from inside because the front door opened just a crack. I could see he had the security chain on. I could also see he looked like a wreck. Through the crack in the door, I could only see one eye, bloodshot, and a bit of his face, unshaven. Are you the magician? Yes, Mr. Pearson. I'm Eli Marks, the magician. He stared back at me. How do I know you're really the magician? The question stumped me. I had certainly witnessed several situations where performers had proved to me that they absolutely weren't magicians, but I was coming up short on an idea of how to prove I was. And then an idea occurred to me. I fell back on the same words magicians have uttered since the dawn of, well, since the dawn of magicians. Um, think of a card. He stared back at me. Are you thinking of a card? I said as I slowly, oh so slowly, reached into my coat pocket. He studied me closely. I sensed he was poised to slam the door. I pulled a boxed deck of cards out of the pocket. Have you thought of a card? He nodded, doing it so gradually it appeared to be happening in slow motion. And what card did you think of? Finally, I detected a weak whisper. Three of spades. Three of spades! I slid the deck of cards out of its cardboard box. Well, if I weren't a magician, could I make your card, the three of spades, reverse itself in this deck of cards? Like this? I made a vague magical gesture and then spread the cards so that he could see them. He looked down at the cards, then up at me to make sure I wasn't doing something tricky then back at the spread of cards in my hands. It appeared to be a completely normal deck of cards. All the cards were different, but one card was face down in the deck. I reached into the spread and pulled the card out, delicately flipping it over so he could see the face of the card. It was the three of spades. Through the crack in the door, I could see his one eye go wide. He closed the door for several seconds a moment later, he swung the door open, not all the way open, but wide enough for me to step through. As he closed the door behind me, oddly, only one thought occupied my mind. Although it had gained me access to the house, I had just burned off a nice 10 minute routine. I hefted my bag, hoping I'd brought enough stuff to get me through this, whatever this turned out to be. The impression I'd gotten from outside was correct. There were no lights on in the house. However, the spotlights the sheriff's department had aimed on the exterior did a remarkably good job of providing plenty of illumination within. The lights also added an eerie quality to the space, forcing long shadows on the wall, like a stark blue sunset was exploding just outside the front windows. Leon waved me toward the living room which was getting the most benefit from the spotlights outside. Furniture consisted of a worn couch, a side table, an easy chair, and a coffee table. The room was a little messy, but the key item or items I was looking for, a gun or guns, were not immediately visible. I turned to my left and could see a small dining room beyond. The dinner table looked to hold the remains of a single meal with the three other chairs set in an orderly fashion around the table. 
What looked like a large family photo was hanging on the far wall, but the long shadows from the spotlights made it hard to see any detail. Once I had a sense of my environment, I turned to survey my host. He was somewhere in his 40s and about three inches shorter than me. A bald spot on the top of his head was clearly in the process of spreading to the rest of his scalp. He wasn't shaking exactly, but he was sort of vibrating. He was clearly nervous. He was wearing an out-of-style suit coat, which hung on him poorly. He'd either lost weight or had never really grown into his father's suit. He wasn't holding a gun, but the coat was bulky enough to hide a weapon and a couple of good-sized cats as well. In fact, it might have been my imagination, but it looked like the left side of the coat was drooping down further than the right. Was there a bulky object in that left pocket? I really couldn't be sure one way or the other, so I decided the best course of action was to proceed as if there was. The coffee table was cluttered with several empty beer bottles and two mostly empty bags of chips. Leon cleared them away quickly, disappearing from the room for a moment. Seconds later, he was back. The trash was gone, and he'd grabbed a straight-back chair from the dining room. He set it in front of the coffee table and gestured that the couch was mine. So you'd like a magic show, I said as I settled in, really trying to sound upbeat and cheerful. I was probably overdoing it. I was supposed to have a magician before, when I was 10, for my birthday. It didn't happen. Like a lot of things didn't happen. He was staring at the coffee table. I was running some possible responses through my head, but before I could settle on one, he spoke again. It didn't happen. And you know, I still want that magician. So I called and booked a magician. He looked up at me. His eyes were really watery. He wasn't crying, but was right on the edge of tears. I'm sort of having a bad week. I nodded. Do you want to talk about it? I'm not sure he actually heard me, but he kept talking. I lost my job. My wife left me. She took the kids. I don't have any money. I have nothing but debts. And I'm just having a bad week. I'm not proud of it, but my first thought was, well, looks like I'm not getting paid for this one. But I quickly shoved that selfish notion aside. Perhaps a little magic can brighten things up. Again, turning the cheerful knob up higher than probably necessary. Do you like card tricks? He stared back at me vacantly. I don't know. Is that what most people like? I'd been reaching for a deck of cards, but his query stopped me cold. I had to admit no one had ever posed that question to me. I had a lot of card tricks in my repertoire, but I'd never really stopped to consider this existential question. Was that? what most people like? Or was it simply what I like doing? Well, I've got card tricks, coin tricks, tricks with ropes, with rubber bands, cups and balls routine. I rattled off quickly, pushing that larger question out of my mind for the time being. Instead, I tried to think about the sort of tricks he might have seen at the 10-year-old birthday party that never happened. I'm sure balloons have been on the program, maybe a coloring book illusion, probably some form of hippity hop rabbits and sponge balls, lots of sponge balls. I had none of those, just cards, coins, rope, rubber bands, and cups and balls, and a couple of paperbacks for a book test if it came down to that, which I hoped it wouldn't. Cards are okay. Well, since you seem to like the three of spades, let's do a little something with that card. I quickly sorted through the deck in my hand and found the card. I handed it to Leon while I reached for the black sharpie in my pocket. He clutched the card but watched my hand very closely. He seemed relieved to see it was just a magic marker as I pulled it from my pocket. Leon, go ahead and sign your name across the face of the card, just so we can make sure I'm not doing anything tricky. I uncapped the pen and handed it to him. He slowly and deliberately signed his name on the card, taking far longer to write four letters than I might have expected. 
Once he appeared satisfied with the result, he tentatively handed back the card. I blew on it to make sure the ink was dry and then launched into my routine. Under normal conditions, I do this modified ambitious card routine pretty quickly, getting some laughs with how swiftly the card jumps to the top of the deck, along with all the variations I'd added. However, I got the immediate sense that doing anything quickly would increase Leon's anxiety. It seemed pretty clear that my primary goal, if I had one, was to make Leon less and not more anxious. I buried the card in the deck and then gave it a tap. So, your three of spades is somewhere in the middle of the deck, right? Leon nodded as he stared at the deck. But you're a fan of the three of spades, and it's a fan of you. So just like that, your card has jumped to the top of the deck. I snapped my fingers to indicate this action, and Leon actually jumped at the sound. I proudly flipped the card over. It was the six of diamonds. Oops. Looks like I did something wrong. Sorry, I began as I prepared to correct this apparent mistake. Let's find your card again. I flipped the deck over and scanned through the cards for the three of spades. Leon watched me closely, his eyes locked on the spread of cards. That's weird. It's nowhere in the deck. I seem to have lost your card. Usually, this point in the trick gets a bit of reaction from the audience, an ooh or an ah, as they realized their card has disappeared entirely from the deck. Leon, as the situation had already made clear, was not my typical audience. You lost the card? You, you don't know where it is? I put out a hand to reassure him. Don't worry. I know where it is. But you said you lost it, and it isn't there. You, you screwed up. I quickly reached into my pocket and pulled out the three of spades. It's okay, Leon. It's right here, right where I put it. It's just part of the act. But I didn't get the sense he was fully understanding the situation. It's a common trope with magicians. We call it magician in trouble. You pretend to make a mistake, but you really didn't. It's just part of the show. So the magician's really not in trouble? Standard procedure. I always know where the card is. Why is that? Because I put it there. He thought about this for a minute, and while he did, I couldn't help flash back to the many conversations, okay, arguments, I'd had with my Uncle Harry on the topic of magician in trouble. Excuse my French, but in my opinion, magician in trouble is just a jerk move on the part of the performer. You've gone to all the trouble to win their sympathy and affection, you make an apparent mistake. The audience feels bad for you, and then you pull the rug out from under them and basically say, ha, I tricked you. I was in charge all along. A jerk move. But I always disagreed with Harry on this point. Harry, I don't think anyone in the audience ever really believes I'm in trouble. They know it's part of the act. What they know and how they feel are two entirely different matters, he'd mutter as he'd walk away, effectively ending the debate, for the moment at least. Magician in trouble. He looked up at me. He was backlit by the lights from outside, but I could see the look of desperation in his eyes. So, so maybe I'm not really in trouble? No, Leon, I thought. You are definitely in trouble, but I figured that wasn't the answer he needed to hear. Sure, maybe you're not in trouble either. Maybe I'm not. I made the executive decision that I'd successfully completed that trick. It was time to move away from magician in trouble to something that might have a more positive feel to it. I felt the deck of cards in my hand. As a performer, I'm not big on metaphors. But a thought occurred to me. It's really all how you look at it, I began, ad-libbing some new patter for a trick I've been doing since I was a teenager. I'd learned it from my Uncle Harry, who had learned it from the guy who had first devised it. I had done it hundreds of times and felt I was probably in a good position to improvise on it a bit. Cards are like life. 
I split the deck in two, flipping one half over in my hands. Sometimes things get mixed up. I quickly shuffled the two halves, combining the face-up half with the face-down half. I completed the shuffle, cut the deck, and then spread the cards for Leon. As you can see, the cards are pretty evenly mixed, some face-up, some face-down. A mess. A mess. He ran his finger across the cards and then pulled his hand away, perhaps concerned he had crossed some imaginary line. I smiled to reassure him, then squared the cards. I quickly cut to some random spots in the deck and flipped it over, reinforcing the idea that all the cards were indeed mixed, face up and face down. But you know what, Leon? Even when things are completely jumbled up in our lives, you know who has the power to put things right? He stared back at me blankly. Once it became clear he wasn't going to answer, I continued as if that had been my plan all along. We do. We can put things back in the right order. I began to snap my fingers and then thought better of it. The last time I'd done that, it had spooked my audience of one more than I liked. So instead, I waved my hand over the table deck. And just like that, order is restored. I spread the deck across the tabletop. All the cards were now facing the same direction. They were all face up, except for one card. I gestured for Leon to flip it over. He reached across and tentatively nudged the card from the spread and turned it. It was the three of spades. Although he was still backlit, I could see Leon's face enough to recognize when he burst into a big smile. He laughed softly as he picked up the card and examined it. For the first time, I really, truly appreciated the name of that trick. Triumph. Triumph indeed, I thought. I didn't want to lose momentum, but I wasn't sure what I could do to help keep this positive vibe rolling. And then I remembered a variation on the trick Uncle Harry had shown me, one that allowed the spectator to take charge of the action. The trick I had just done was perfected by Di Vernon. If I was remembering properly, it was based on a gimmick trick by Theodore Deland. However, the variation I was trying to remember had been put together by Bob Hummer. I shook my head, trying to escape this unnecessary cascade of attribution. I needed to focus on how the trick was performed, not a chain of evidence on who had created it. As the steps of the routine began to come into focus in the back of my brain, I scooped up the cards and quickly counted out two piles of 20. You know, Leon, it's not just magicians who can do this trick, I said, as I tried to keep count of the cards as I was dealing them out. Anyone can create a mess, and anyone can fix it. Really? He was still looking at his three of spades. Really? I slid one packet of cards toward him. Let's do the trick together. Leon took the cards and then earnestly followed my every move, mirroring each step with his own small packet of cards. First, count out ten cards, I said, and then flip that pile over face up. Leon moved slowly, working diligently on the assignment. Once he was done, he looked up expectantly. Okay, now let's create a mess, I said. I took a card from the face-up packet and started a new pile, then took one from the face-down group. I alternated the process, taking one card from each packet so that every other card was face-up in this new pile. Leon closely followed each step as I made it, making identical moves with his packet. I spread the cards in this new packet revealing a neat mix of cards face up and face down. Leon did the same with his packet, touching the cards to reassure himself that they really were a mess. The cards are certainly a mess, aren't they? Leon nodded. I squared my packet and Leon did the same with his. Then I stopped. This was the point where the trick got, well, tricky. This portion of the routine was very procedure-heavy and not 
procedure just for the sake of making things complicated. I had to complete the proper steps in the exact right order, or I'd end up making a bigger mess than I'd started with, which, under the circumstances, didn't strike me as a particularly good idea. I'm pretty sure I sounded confident as I directed Leon in the next series of moves, but it was pure acting on my part. I was mentally scrambling, hoping the sequence I was following was correct, but never really absolutely certain of the directions I was giving. Finally, we each had our packets face down in front of us. Leon looked up at me, his eyes wide in anticipation. So we made a mess, didn't we? Doing a sort of standard recap of the actions we'd just completed. Usually when I did this, it was to reinforce the idea of how much free choice the spectator had or the fairness of the procedure. But right now, I was doing it just to buy some time. The more time it took before I revealed the end of the trick, the longer I had before things potentially went wrong. We had face-up cards. We had face-down cards. Utter chaos, am I right? Leon nodded. We made a mess. And then we took some very specific steps, didn't we? As I said it, I was hoping against hope that those steps had, in fact, been the correct steps. Yes, we took steps to fix our mess. Let's see how those steps we took helped our situation. I gestured toward his packet of cards as I slowly, oh, so slowly, began to spread my own packet. Leon pushed awkwardly on his cards, and they were gradually revealed. All the cards, all twenty, were face down. I glanced down at my own packet, which, mercifully, was similarly correct in its orientation. I breathed a sigh of relief. I have no idea how audible it was, because whatever sound I made was covered by laughter. Actual laughter coming from Leon. He was smiling brightly, first at the cards, then at me, then back at the cards. It was a mess, an utter mess, and then I took some steps, and the mess went away. He looked back at me. The mess went away. That's right, Leon. You've always had the power to straighten up the mess. For a second, I was worried I was sounding too much like Glinda in The Wizard of Oz, but Leon didn't seem to notice. Leon was still smiling broadly. I can straighten up the mess. Yes, you can. I was about to gather up all the cards, but I suddenly realized the image in front of Leon, order out of chaos, was a good one to let linger if only for a few minutes more. So, how did you like the magic show? I liked it a lot. He was still smiling, his fingers grazing the spread of cards in front of him. So, what do you say we go outside and straighten up this other mess? I tensed as I asked the question, not sure if this sudden pivot might shift his mood in a less positive direction. He stared at me blankly for what felt like a long moment. Sure thing. Let's go fix this thing. I got up as well and grabbed my bag. I decided to leave the cards where they were. I didn't want to break the mood, and I could certainly afford to lose the cost of one deck of cards. Leon began to move toward the front door, but before he got far, I tentatively reached out and touched his shoulder. He spun around. A flash of something shifted across his expression. What? Somehow, I maintained a cool, almost indifferent air. It certainly did not reflect what was going on inside me. You know, it's pretty warm outside tonight, I gestured toward his suit jacket. You probably don't need that. He considered this for a moment. You're right. I probably don't. He let the bulky jacket slip off his slim frame and drop to the ground. I heard a padded clunk as the jacket landed on the hardwood floor. It might have been his phone in one of the pockets, or it might have been something else. I opted not to dwell on it and headed toward the door, glancing back to make sure I had Leon in tow. 
He was following me, but he stopped to take one last look at the spread of cards on his side of the coffee table. I opened the door and stepped out, immediately holding up a hand to indicate, well, to indicate that I was okay enough to be able to hold up a hand. Leon followed me and we both squinted at the bright lights, which were nearly blinding us. I wrapped a protective arm around his bony shoulder and he leaned into me as we started up the front walk toward the street. Sheriff Martin, this is Leon Pearson. He's had a rough week and realizes he has to correct some mistakes. Yes, I do, Leon said. Although his voice was so soft, I was probably the only one who heard him. Mr. Pearson, if you'll come with me, we'll see what we can do to help you out. Sheriff Martin took Leon by the arm and looked to me to release my grip on the small man. I hesitated a moment, but the sheriff gave me a reassuring nod, so I let him go. Leon was immediately swept away by the throng, the crowd appearing to steer him toward an Anoka County Sheriff's vehicle. I found myself suddenly alone in the front yard, with all the attention now focused on getting Leon quickly searched and into the vehicle. With my part in the drama now behind me, I turned toward where I'd parked my car, not sure if I was blocked in by emergency vehicles or if I could make an easy exit. There was considerable chatter all around me, so I'm surprised I heard a weak voice calling my name. I turned to see that it was Leon. They were just putting him into the back seat of a squad car, but he was resisting the action, trying to get my attention. Eli! Eli! Everyone seemed to quiet as I stopped. Yes, Leon? Be sure to mark this date in your calendar. His face breaking out in a wide grin. I'll want to be sure to book you again for my birthday next year. With that, he was maneuvered into the back seat and moments later, the car made its way down the block and disappeared around the corner. As I headed back to my car, a phrase often employed by my Uncle Harry popped into my head. If you can book enough repeat business, Eli, you will never, ever need to advertise. I smiled wryly. If I continued to survive these engagements, I appeared to be on my way to that goal, one gig at a time. You've been listening to Magician in Trouble, an Eli Marks short mystery, written by John Gaspard, read by Jim Cunningham, Music by Chip Barber.